So I'm an oceanographer. I study the physics of the ocean, trying to understand why ocean currents look the way they do, how they might be changing, and the role the ocean plays in the global climate system. What is an oceanographer doing speaking at a tech conference? Well, the size and complexity of ocean data sets has forced us to take computation very seriously. Um, in our group, we're very heavy users of the scientific Python software stack. Yesterday, I wore my oceanographer hat, and I talked about the work we're doing in the Pangeo project to build tools to make it easier and faster and more fun to work with big uh, ocean and climate data sets. Giving a keynote on the big stage is an opportunity for me to zoom out a little bit and uh, look at the state of science as a whole. All scientific fields are now facing challenges related to big data. So my goal here today is to share what those look like for us and ask if they look the same to you uh, in your field. If so, we would love to work and collaborate together to solve these challenges. So when I talk about big scientific data, what do I mean? Here's an example of a fluorescence microscopy image of neurons in the brain. Uh, and you can see this is a huge image with incredibly rich structure and detail. And neuroscientists are using this to understand how our minds work. Um, we can also, you know, if we start looking at the Earth, we see similar types of structure, right? We have imagery. This is of a river in northern Russia. And uh, we can see an incredibly rich, multi-scale structure, um, fascinating to the eye and fascinating to scientists. Moving more to my field, this is an image from satellite of the ocean color, which tells us where phytoplankton live, where they grow and die, and how ocean currents move them around. These are really the lungs of our planet. Um, and so what happens to them in the future is going to affect our whole society. You might want to look at the sun. So here's an image of the sun from the NASA Solar Dynamics Observatory. You can see incredibly complex and rich structure here. Um, and what the sun does, of course, affects the Earth a lot. You can zoom out even more and look at the data from the European Space Agency, Gaia data release 2, which reveals in unprecedented detail the structure and beauty of the galaxy that we live in. So what do data sets like these all have in common? They're big. I'm talking about terabytes to petabytes of data. They are largely produced through big government-funded science projects. And this is a trend in science, where before individual researchers would be generating data in, in their lab, now to take on big problems, we have to work at a much larger collaborative scale. Da data sets like these are cited in thousands of papers and used by thousands of scientists. So they have a huge impact. And they're absolutely ripe for new data-driven analysis methods like machine learning and artificial intelligence. For the most part, they are trapped behind slow FTP servers, frustrating data access portals, and fragmented APIs. OK, so uh, what sort of science am I talking about? I'm not talking about science where we just want to get a little piece of a big data set. I'm talking about where we want to look at the whole data set. So here's a fascinating example, a uh, recent paper in Science by Alan and Pavelski, where they analyzed the entire Landsat uh, imagery archive to determine what area of Earth is covered by water in rivers and streams. And they found out it's 45% more than we previously thought. It's a, it's a big revision, and this has major implications for the carbon dioxide budget of Earth. How do we do this kind of science? Well, let's rewind to the Stone Age of 2014. Uh, how did this work? We, we generally have a data provider that's got some data that we want. If we're lucky, there's an FTP service there, and we can just suck the data down onto our computer. Maybe that data provider has some weird API 
that we've never seen before. So we have to write it, learn that API and write a script to get the data. Worst case scenario, there's some sort of GUI web browser interface. And in that case, we often just say, forget it. I'm going to work on something else. We suck the data down to our computer, and we write a loop to iterate through all these big files. And finally, we, we get to some sort of result, some sort of plot. What we've done is created a dark repository. I really like this term. A dark repository is a copy of a data set that we've made just so we can compute on it. I think this concept is familiar to lots of you. So in, in this workflow, the data has to be extracted from a remote server. And so we have to decide what data to download a priori. This is important because this makes us, we have to decide what we're looking for before we've found it. Uh, and it's, it's slow. So you know, basically, you, you try some calculation. You go get lunch. You come back. You see if your calculation worked. And it's boring. So you know, we've got Facebook and Twitter always calling us uh, instead of thinking about science, right? This is a real issue. So you know, the consequences of this type of system I observed in my own research group. Our scientists, our PhD students and postdocs, they're actually having to learn to be data engineers and spending their time writing code to process data rather than thinking about science problems. It forces a conservative approach to science. Because of the, the pain of working this way, we have to look for expected things rather than discovering new things. The provenance of the data is obscured. So in our dark repository, it, it's not connected to the data provider anymore. What if there's a correction to that data set? Um, and as a consequence, it's really almost impossible to reproduce this type of uh, science, even though many scientists are working with the same data sets. OK, so a new way of working is emerging. And today, a lot of us are working this way. Instead of just using our personal computers, we can put our analysis onto some sort of big server or cluster that lives at our university. And thanks to tools like Jupyter, our students and postdocs can access that resource, share that resource, and use it to process data in a parallel way that's much faster than before. So you know, I have some examples of what code using Dask or X-Array looks like. Um, and this, this is a great development. It's, it's fantastic to be working this way. So uh, the analysis is much faster. These tools allow us to think about data sets as a whole rather than files. Um, and we can iterate quickly and explore new, new ideas. But we still have a dark repository. So I think you know where I'm going. Uh, this is what we have to be doing. Right? We need to be bringing the compute together with the data. When we do this, uh, our, our high-performance computing, our parallel clusters can talk directly to, to where the raw data is stored at high bandwidth. And we can really iterate quickly with our science. And we don't need to copy the data. We don't need to make a, 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 re a replica of it. This is what we are trying to build in the Pangeo project. So, I invite you all to go check out pangeo.pydata.org. Um, we're a group of Earth scientists working with a few software engineers to build an environment where we can have our data and our computing in the same place. Not just one environment, but actually a set of modular tools that allow anyone to create these environments. We don't have a lot of people. We don't have a lot of money, um, which is fine, because what we realized is that all of the building blocks for these uh, big data science gateways basically already exist. They just have to be plugged together. So Jupyter Hub, uh, and in particular, the Zero to Jupyter Hub uh, Kubernetes project make it really easy for you to stand up a Jupyter service for many users. We now have great parallel computing tools. We use Dask. Uh, you, you could use something like Spark. And in scientific Python, in the scientific Python world, in the open source world in general, we've got great domain-specific software. In our field of climate, we use X-Array. If you're an astronomer, you probably use AstroPy. 
And we understand how to build cloud-optimized data formats that allow us to uh, more quickly and uh, efficiently access and work with big data sets. So we've really enjoyed building this prototype. It has allowed our scientists to be more productive and have, a, have more fun and be connected directly to the data in, in a cloud environment. But we, we, we can't have this yet in science. We're not there at the large scale. For the most part, uh, data repositories are still not accessible to computing. So what I would like to see happen is I would like to see data providers think about how these tools can interact with their data sets directly. I would like to see data providers putting their data on the cloud or on HPC systems in an in a analysis-ready, optimized format. And NASA is already going this route. So NASA is committed to putting 100 petabytes of Earth science data on the cloud over the next five to 10 years. So, what are the, uh, so once we have this sort of cloud-native science, uh, the advantages will be immense. As scientists, we can write expressive code, interact lazily with full data sets, and really think about big problems. We can run calculations on big data sets at interactive speed, try out new ideas, you know, be creative. We're not duplicating data. We'll save a lot of money. We don't need to be storing the same data sets a thousand different times under people's desks across the world. If we can build this, it will really help put the curiosity, discovery, and fun back into science. OK, so my last slide is very busy. It sum summarizes some of the challenges we face that I want to talk to people about how to overcome. So as scientists, we have kind of two options of where to build this type of thing. Traditionally, we've worked on big government high-performance computing resources, things like NSF's Exceed program or uh, DOE's NERSC computer. The commercial cloud is also emerging as a very viable place to do data-driven computing. And each of these platforms has their trade-offs. So scientists are familiar with government HPC centers. And uh, when they're willing, like NERSC is, you can build uh, interactive uh, computing portals there. These resources, though, are they're available to all federally funded scientists, which is great. But that's also a downside. They're available only to federally funded scientists. What about all the other people? What about people in the developing world who want to work with big data sets? Um, the commercial cloud, on the other hand, is available to anyone with a credit card. But scientists generally do not know how to interact with uh, uh, the cloud. And our financial system in science is not set up to allow scientists to uh, acquire large-scale cloud computing resources. Working on traditional HPC systems is not inherently interactive, whereas in the cloud, we can burst quickly into huge numbers of compute nodes via the spot market. Um, so there's a lot of trade-offs we need to consider. And I don't know all the answers, but maybe some of you in this room do. So, I want to close by just inviting you to join the discussion happening around Pangeo. We have a GitHub repository where we discuss all this stuff. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to share what we're up to. <laughs>